Good morning, church. Did anybody come ready to worship our God this morning? Yeah, let's stand to our feet for worship. This is my worship. This is my offering. In every moment, I withhold nothing. I'm learning to trust you, even when I can't see it. And even in suffering, I have to believe it. If you say it's wrong, then I'll say no. If you say release, I'm letting go If you're in it with me, I'll begin And when you say to jump, I'm diving in If you say be still, then I will If you say to trust, I will obey I don't want to follow my own ways I'm done chasing feelings, spirit Felt like a burden, but once I could grasp it, you took me further, further than I was asking. And simply to see you, it's worth it all. My life is an altar. Let your fire fall If you say it's wrong, then I'll say no If you say release, I'm letting go If you're in it with me, I'll begin And when you say to jump, I'm diving in If you say be still, then I will wait If you say to trust, I will obey Teach me how to follow in your ways I'm done chasing feelings Spirit, lead me
Lord, you are here with me. You're present in everything. So I lift my voice. I have resolved to serve you, Lord. Jesus, be all I see. Jesus, in You called me out upon the waters, the great unknown, where feet may fail. And there I find you in the mystery, in oceans deep, my faith will stay. Your grace abounds in deepest waters, your sovereign hand will be my guide. Where feet may fail and fear surrounds me, you've never failed and you won't start now. will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves when oceans rise my 
my soul will rest in your embrace for I am yours and you are mine oh hey and you above the waves my 
just thank you for this morning and for this time that we have together, Lord. God, we just ask that any distractions that we walked in here with, God, that we would put them aside in this moment, God, that we'd be present, we would be ready to seek your word, God. I pray that in that, that you would stir up a new hunger in every single person in this room, God, to know you deeply, to know your word deeply, God, and to walk it out and put it into motion, God. We pray that through this series, you would teach us to have a faith like never before where we can step out and follow wherever you may lead us, God. God, we thank you for this time and for this place that you've blessed us with, God. And we just pray and ask, God, that you would show us how to best please you with our time spent here. God, we ask all these things in your name, God. And ultimately, we desire to glorify and please you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Come on, church. Give God a hand clap of praise this morning as you take your seat. So good to see you guys, man. We started a series last Sunday, and the name of the series is called Faith It. You might have heard the phrase that said, fake it until you make it. But as believers of Jesus Christ, we truly believe that our God is not asking us to fake it, but our God is asking us to faith it. Faith is such a big deal in the eyes of God. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, we talked about this last week, that without faith, it is impossible to please God. That's a strong statement. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And I don't know about you, but I desire to please God. And since I desire to please God, and I know that you desire to please God, we have to take this Sunday's um, title of this message and put it into motion. And this Sunday is called Overcoming the Ledge. Overcoming the Ledge. Man, I'm excited. I hope you're ready to receive because I'm ready to teach and preach a little bit this morning. Overcoming the Ledge. Y'all like my new boat? Thank you, Truesdale. Appreciate this new boat. Listen, man, I love this boat. Let me tell you guys why I love this boat. Everything that I need is right here in this boat with me. I mean, I am cozy. I am comfortable. I am satisfied right here in the boat. Early this week, I went shopping already. I went grocery shopping, so I got a few items in here. I mean, of course, y'all already know what time it is, early in the morning. I got my Starbucks in here for this morning. Where are my Starbucks drinkers at this morning? In my Starbucks? All right, cool. Three of y'all, all All right, all right. (laughs) You know, so I got everything I need. I even have Logan's cozy socks that I like to wear. She tells me to stay out of them, but it is so comfortable. So I got these in here to keep me comfortable. Of course, I got my phone charger. You can't go anywhere without an iPad or a phone charger, right? Matter of fact, I got an extra cell phone in here just in case my other phone dies or breaks down, whatever the case may be. Oh, I almost forgot about this bad boy right here. I got my cozy blanket in here. I like to cuddle up and watch Netflix and Blacklist and all that stuff. Don't judge us. Don't judge us. I even got my, I'm not sure if y'all tried this out yet. I got my body armor in here just in case I get dehydrated while I'm inside of the boat. It's like a brand new Gatorade. Make sure you guys try this out. I got everything I need. Eli's not here right now, so I can share this. I got some candy that me and Logan borrowed from Eli from um, <laughs> Fallelujah Fest last week and all that good stuff. I got, oh, I almost forgot about this. Wow, man. The Iron Bear Award, New Bern High School football. Got some trophies in here, you know. Oh, my Youth Leader Rocks Award, PDY 2011, Albert B. Almore, Christian Provision Ministries. I remember that. It kind of had like the whole little Oscars things going on. That was pretty cool. I remember that. That was a big moment in my life right there, you know. Oh, uh, certificate or ordination, May 2010, um, May the 30th. Oh, man, another big time in my life right there, man. Ah, I remember this, man. In 2017, I was one of the 20 under 40 award, man. I mean, this, I'm just, I'm just having a good old time right here in this boat. I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable in this boat. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm so comfortable in this boat. I don't ever want to leave this boat. 
And I think right there is the struggle with many of us in this room today. See, your first fill in the blank is this. Everything that God had for you is in the boat. But everything that God has for you is outside of the boat. Everything that God had for you is in the boat. But everything that God has for you yet to accomplish is outside of the boat. See, inside of the boat, you already seen it. Everything that's inside of the boat, you already heard it. Everything that's inside of the boat, you already experienced and you already accomplished it. It's already inside of the boat. But there are some things that you are yet to see that is outside of your comfort zone. Some stuff that you are yet to see that is outside of the boat. I'm not going to lie to y'all this morning. I see you waving at me. I'm not going to lie to y'all this morning. It's hard to leave the boat. Sis, you'd be amazed how many people are settling for living in the boat instead of living out loud the promises of God. But this morning, faith is calling See, understand this, write this down. Faith wants more for you than you could ever want for yourself. Faith wants more for you than you could ever want for yourself. And let me tell you why. That's a a strong statement, but let me tell you why we can back that statement up. Because faith comes from God. Faith wants more for you than you can ever want for yourself. And faith, well, faith comes from God. How do you know? Well, the Bible tells me in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, he says, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Now, I think that's like also a twofold thing. We don't need to walk around with pride and we don't need to walk around with arrogance. But at the same time, we also don't need to walk around beating ourselves down. We also don't need to walk around discrediting who we are in the eyes of God. So you got to find that medium. He says, I want you to find that medium, that middle ground. I want you to look at yourself in the correct manner. And then he says this. He says, in accordance with the faith that God has Distribute it to each of you. See, faith comes from God. And faith wants more for you than you can ever want for yourself. That's why this morning it's time for somebody to overcome the ledge. Peter did. The disciple Peter overcame the ledge. See, We forget that Peter was a human being. We forget that Peter was just like you and I. But even deeper than that, the Bible lets me know that Peter was a fisherman by trade. So if there was anybody that was definitely comfortable in the boat, if there was anybody that knew the boat, if there was anybody that could have definitely lived inside of the boat, it had to be Peter because Peter was a fisherman by trade. But the legacy and the experience that you and I are still talking about today, Peter did not find it inside of the boat. Where did Peter find it? Peter found it outside of the boat. Peter found it by overcoming the ledge. Let's read the story. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 14, verse 22, the Bible says that this man by the name of Peter lets us know that when Jesus was hanging out one day, immediately Jesus made his disciples what? Get into the boat and then go before them to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. Verse 23 said, and says, and when he has sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was there alone. 
But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Verse 25 says, but now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they was troubled, saying, ah, it's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. That's my interpretation. That's how I see it in my mind. <laughs> Make sure y'all awake. Verse 27 says, but immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, saying, Lord, save me, exclamation mark. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, oh, you of little faith. Why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? Thought number one this morning, fill this blank in. Know your surroundings. Know your surroundings. <laughs> Let's read it again. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 14, verse 22, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. Verse 23 says, and when he has sent the multitudes away, check this out, Carlos, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now, when evening came, he was there alone. And that's powerful to me because the Bible says that Jesus was up on the mountain while the boat was down in the sea. Jesus was up on the mountain while the boat was down in the sea. I'm trying to get somebody to understand this morning that God is on top of your situation. I know you might not feel it right now. I know you might feel afraid. I know you might have tears in your eyes. I know you might have uncertainty in your heart, but I come by here this morning to preach the gospel to you, to let you know today that the God that I serve is on on top of your situation. The Bible says that the boat was down in the sea. And the Bible says that Jesus was on the mountaintop praying. And I'm speaking to some people today. You feel like the winds are beating you down. You feel like your life is being tossed back and forth. And you want to know, where's my God at? I'm going to tell you where your God is. He's on top of your situation. Later on, the Bible says in verse 28, <clears throat> the Bible says, and Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. See, see, Peter was like, like where that curtain is. Peter's there, and Jesus is walking on the water, having a good time. And Peter says, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you. Command me to come to you. Could God Almighty write this down? God is ahead of your situation. So God is on top of your situation. Lord, if it's you, ask me to come to you. God is also ahead of your situation. And the last time I read my Bible, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So let's put it all together. My God is on top of my situation. My God is ahead of my situation. And my God is with me in my situation. You might want to write that down. My God is on top of my situation. My God is ahead of my situation. And my God is with me in my situation. This morning, God is telling me to tell somebody, know that you're surrounded by goodness. Know that you're surrounded by grace. Know that you're surrounded by mercy. Know that you're surrounded by favor. I got a question for y'all this morning, church, and online viewers the question is this how can you fail when you're surrounded by the one who can't fail 
That's all I'm trying to get the people to see this morning, Lance. I'm trying to get the people to see if I'm surrounded by grace, if I'm surrounded by goodness, if I'm surrounded by mercy, if my God is on top of the situation, if my God is ahead of the situation, if my God is with me in the situation, the Bible says that glory is my rear guard as well. How can I fail when I'm surrounded by the one who can't fail? This morning, you need to be encouraged. You need to know your surroundings. You need to know your surroundings. Hey, jot this down. Whatever God is asking you to step into, he's already there. Whatever God is asking you to step into, he's already there. Not only that, but whatever you're dealing with, before you dealt with it, God was there. I don't know what you're dealing with this morning, but whatever you are dealing with before it even dealt the hand to you, God was already there. Hallelujah. Look, look, look. See, David understood this. Listen to what David wrote. David understood this and wrote Psalm chapter 30, Psalm chapter 139, verse 7. David began to think about his life. David began to think about everything that he'd been through. He began to think about those times where he thought that he would never escape, but somehow, some way, God Almighty made a way out of no way. And David began to check out and understand his surroundings. And David said, where can I go from your spirit, Lord? He says, where can I flee from your presence? He says, if I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, one translation says, if I make my bed in Sheol, if I make my bed in hell, you're, you're, you're everywhere. Look at verse 9. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, ah, oh, there it is. If I settle on the far side of the sea. Where was the disciples? That's right, they was in the sea. Look at verse 10. Even there, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. See, since God is on top of your situation, it's your responsibility to make sure that your faith doesn't bottom out in the midst of your situation. Since God is on top of your situation, it's your responsibility to make sure that your faith doesn't bottom out in the midst of the situation. God's got you covered. One thing that can help you understand this, one thing you need to do since you understand that God has you covered, another thing that's going to really help you walk out is this. Expect the contrary. When you're walking with God, when you're walking in obedience, you need to expect the contrary. See, the Bible says in verse 24, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea. I don't know who I'm speaking to right now, but you have found yourself in the middle of a situation that you thought that you would never found find yourself in. I'm in the middle. How does the middle feel? Well, this side of the middle feels, it feels like I'm being tossed by the waves. And I thought it was going to be this, but now it's that. And now the wind is contrary in my life. Good God Almighty. See, the boat was now in the middle of the sea. It was tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Write this down. You're going to need faith for the middle and faith for the contrary. See, it's fun to start stuff. It's fun to begin stuff. It's fun to launch stuff. But you get tired in the middle. It's fun and it's easy when everybody is for you, when everybody's patting you on the back. But what do you do when you find yourself facing contrary situations? You are going to need faith for what? The middle. And you're going to need faith for 
the contrary. I'm, try, I'm trying to tell you. It's, it's, it's fun to start stuff. It's, 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 fun. it's fun to have kids, but you're going to need faith for the middle for those teenage years. When they ain't goo goo gaga and they talking back, 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 and they get the back. Oh, don't delete that. No, we don't do that. We don't do that. <laughs> See, it's often in the middle of obedience, it's in the middle of the dream that God gave you that you will often find your mustard seed of faith being attempted to be tossed by the waves and by the wind. The Bible says that the wind was contrary. Come what may, don't allow the contrary winds to dictate your faith. I will not allow the winds of opposition. I will not allow the winds of the whispers. I will not allow the winds of the nose. I will not allow the winds of being misunderstood. I will not allow whatever your wind may be, whatever contrary season you have found yourself in, don't allow the contrary winds to dictate your faith. This next fill in the blank says, expect the contrary, but don't be controlled by the contrary. I'm trying to get you to understand that you need to have the expectation of God, but also understand that the adversary specializes in resistance. I didn't say that he was going to take you out, but you need to understand that there will be some resistance. I refuse to be controlled by the contrary. And that way, see, if, if I could get you to understand this, that way when it happens, you won't be taken back. That way when it happens, you won't be caught off guard when the contrary begins to happen. Watch this, church. After all, it may feel like contrary winds are working against you. But when it comes to the things of God, contrary winds are actually working for you. What do you mean? See, contrary winds often serve as confirmation that you're heading on the right track and that you must be somebody. You're being fought so hard because you're heading in the right direction. Contrary winds often serve as confirmation that you're heading on the right track and that you must be somebody. See, Satan doesn't just come against nobody. He doesn't come against people that, are shaking, that aren't shaking things up. He doesn't come against people that are silent. He doesn't come against people that are keeping their mouth closed. He doesn't come against people that aren't shaking up the kingdom of darkness. But he does come against people that begin to walk by faith and not by silence. He does come against people that begin to speak those things that be not as though they were. He does come against people that make up in their mind, for God I'm going to live and for God I'm going to die. He does come against people that say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. See, you might want to write this down right here. See, Satan only fights you when you're en route towards the new you, never when you're en route back to the old you. Satan only fights you when you're en route towards the new you. Never when you're en route back to the old you and you're being fought so hard because of the call of God that's on your life. You're being fought so hard because you're a world changer. You're being fought so hard because you're a curse breaker. And Satan is afraid that if you ever reach your full potential, that you'll reach people further than your eyes can see, further than your mind can imagine. So, Pastor, what does he do? Let me teach you. He attacks your mind. Because your mind is the carriership of your destiny. You'll never make a difference. They don't want to hear from you. God can't use you. You don't have the experience. Your testimony is the greatest experience that you will ever have. He attacks the mind. You disqualify. You all this stuff he says. So, so he attacks the mind because your mind is the carriership of your destiny. That's why you have to fight through the contrary. You have to fight through the resistance. You have to fight through the opposition. You have to fight through the naysayers. You have to fight through the pain. You have to fight through being misunderstood. You have to fight through being dropped. And sometimes you got to fight through this, this, what, I'm not sure what it is, but I can sum it up like this. You have to fight through the wind. Yeah. See, 
You can expect the wind when there's an expectation on you to win. You can expect the wind when there's an expectation on you to win. Oh, man, I wish I had time to talk about Matthew chapter 16, how Jesus told Peter, he says, Satan, Simon, Barjona, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. And then he says, I give it to you, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and you're going to shape things up. I'm going to use you. And a couple of verses later, Satan begins to attack Peter so much so that Jesus says, Satan, Get behind me, you a stumbling block. Satan heard the prophecy that was on Peter's life. And he did all that he could to try to intercept the prophecy that was on Peter's life. Because you can expect the wind when there's an expectation on you to win. Write this scripture down. Luke chapter 22, verses 31 through 32. So in Matthew chapter 16, right around about verse um, 16, Jesus began to prophesy that I'm going to use you to build my church, and he did. But the, after, after Satan heard that prophecy, he began to mess with Peter every single day because of the call of God that was on his life. And in Jesus' final hours, the Bible says in Luke chapter 22, verse 31, he says, Simon. Jesus said, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. He says, Simon, Simon, speaking to Peter's old man, Simon, Simon. The devil just asked me, could he sift you as wheat? And then in verse 32, he says, but I prayed for you. Good God Almighty. He says, <laughs> he says, but I prayed for you. Watch this, that your own faith may not fail. Oh, oh. He didn't pray that we wouldn't go through anything. He prayed that my faith wouldn't fail in the middle of the storm. Do you understand that he could have prayed Satan away? He says, I'm not praying that you don't go through nothing. I'm praying in the middle of it that your faith does not fail. Luke chapter 22, verse 32. Listen to what he said. So Jesus says, I'm praying that in the middle of it, that your faith does not fail. And then he turned around, and this is what he said. He says, oh, my God. And when you have come back to me, strengthen your brothers. Oh, my God. There was an expectation that the wind is going to come. There was an expectation that the attack was going to come. But there was a greater expectation that Peter was going to win. He says, after you overcome, turn around, preach the gospel, strengthen your brothers. Do you hear what I just said? The Holy Spirit says that Jesus expected Peter to go through a test, to go through a, go through a storm, but he also expected him to make it out on the other side of the storm. You can expect the wind when there's an expectation on you to win. So much resistance, so much wind because of the expectation that's on your life. Man, when I see the wind, this is what I do now. Allow the resistance to cue your persistence. I got to keep going. I got to keep fighting. I got to keep stretching. I got to keep serving. I got to keep loving. I got to keep giving. Allow the, per allow the resistance to cue your persistence. We will expect the contrary, but we will not be controlled by the contrary. But I'm going to tell you what this church will do by the spirit of the living God that's inside of us. We will defeat the ledge. This was your next point. Defeat the ledge. What do you do when you sense that God is calling you to step over the ledge? What do you do when you sense that God is calling you to step over the ledge? Hear this, y'all. Have you ever noticed that Jesus did not verbally initiate the request? Peter did. Peter said, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come. I wonder, was Peter responding verbally to something internally that he sensed that Christ was asking him to do? And Peter responded to this internal pull that he felt tugging at his heart. But what about you? I know the boy's like, who are you talking to? 
Because something was tugging at his heart. Something was asking him to write a book. Something was asking him to start the business. Something was tugging at his heart to go back to school. Something was tugging at his heart to apply for the job that he did not feel that he had the experience for. Something was tugging at his life even though nobody else heard it. It was something on the inside and something is tugging at you this morning on the inside. And Peter responded, but what about you this morning? When will you respond? I believe this morning that's what God is asking you today. When will you respond? There's something that's been tugging at your heart to start something, to initiate something, to reach out to somebody, to do something. Nobody else hears it It's, it's because it's not for them to hear. It's for you to hear. And the Bible says that he responded, if it's you, bid me to come. When will you respond? Oh, man. And see, and see, and see you got to understand this. Don't allow your assignment to die with you in the boat. It's your next fill in the blanks. Don't allow your assignment to die with you in the boat. Like Logan reminded me between services, do you know how many people are attached to the assignment that is on your life? What if I would have told God, no, thank you to Motion Church? What, what if I would have told God, no, thank you to the call of God that was on my life? All these things that he accomplished, which I know there's so much more, but none of those things would have taken place and I would not have made an impact. I would not have led so many people to a relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm trying to tell you, the call of God and the assignment that is on your life is bigger than you. It's bigger than your feelings. It's bigger than fear. It's connected to generations. It's connected to so many people. You can't afford to say no. Man, I'm, I'm preaching with everything that I had this morning. Don't allow your assignment to die with you in the boat. But it's in moments like this. Be sure to check in with God before you check in with people. This is no disrespect towards people. But people, but, but Peter could not consult with the other 11 disciples about this because Peter was getting ready to do something that had never been done before. I can hear him right now. What if Peter would have asked the boys in the boat, hey, what do y'all think if I step over this ledge and try walking on the water? Man, you better stay in this boat. Are you crazy? You can't walk on the water. You can't go back to school. You can't stop that business. You can't write a book. You can't start a church. You can't do this. You can't do that. Sometimes you can't consult with people and no disrespect. I believe in godly counsel, but there are times in your life where you got to make sure that you consult with God. Let me tell you why. It's hard to be a water walker. Walker, if all you surround yourself with is boat dwellers. And there is, there, there is no disrespect to the boat dwellers, but it's hard for you to be a water walker. It's hard for you to, 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 to do and to be what God has asked you to do and to become if all you do is surround yourself with boat dwellers. And if you ask him boat dwellers for wise counsel, if you ask him boat dwellers for godly advice, they can tell you to stay in the boat. They can tell you to play it safe. But I want to let you know there are times where faith does not make sense. Lord, if it's you, ask me to come. Peter, what you doing? I'm walking by faith and not by sight. The same boat, the same storm, the same ledge, but only one had the faith to overcome it. Y'all ever thought about that? Twelve disciples, they all in the same boat. They all in the same storm. They all had the same ledge to, to cross but only one had the faith to overcome it. So the only person he could check in with was God. With all the respect, even John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, he stayed in the boat. So the only person that he could check in with was God Almighty. He says, Lord, if this is you, confirm it and ask me to come. See, understand this, you guys. Talking about it in the boat is easy. Planning for it while in a safe place is absolutely no problem. But stepping over the ledge, honestly, is where things become frightening. 
But just like Kristen Wright told us at a Catalyst conference a few years back, she said, do it afraid. Do it afraid. Overcome the ledge afraid. Start the business afraid. Start the blog afraid. Whatever God is asking you to do, whatever he's speaking to your heart, do it afraid. In other words, she was simply saying this, feel the fear and do it anyway. Feel the fear and do it anyway. I'm going to feel the fear, but I'm going to step out on faith because there's something pulling me to start a church called Motion Church. I'm going to feel the fear, and I'm going to do it anyway because there's something pulling on the inside, asking me to write books. And years later, I wrote 23 books because I responded to the call, but there was something in my mind. What if I write the books and nobody reads them? What if I write the books and nobody sells them? It's not about that. It's all about obedience. Feel the fear and do it anyway. I learned something over the last couple of years, which is your next fill in the blank, just because you're trembling doesn't mean that you're not trusting. We confuse trembling with lack of trust. No, I'm trembling, but I'm still trusting. I'm trembling, but I'm still moving. I'm trembling, but I'm still being obedient. My hands are a little bit sweaty. I don't know the outcome. I don't know the results. The outcome is not up to me. The obedience part is up to me. Just because you're trembling doesn't mean that you're not trusting. So Jesus said one word, come. Come on. (laughs) I probably would prefer a a sentence, at least, I mean, a a longer sentence than that. You know, (laughs) at least three sentences, maybe a paragraph, I don't know. Maybe a letter, I don't know. Jesus just said, come. As I begin to think about it, though, that's what this gospel is. It's the invitation with that word, come. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 22, verse 17, and the spirit and the bride say, come and let him who has ears say, come and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. See, sometimes we think that we're unqualified. Sometimes we think that we are unworthy, but God is saying to you the same thing that he said to Peter, the same thing that his gospel is full of, the invitation to come. So you got to understand this today. He calls out what he sees, not our failures come. He sees more inside of you than you see inside of yourself. He sees more inside of you than sometimes people see. And he calls out what he sees, not our failures. You're all surrounded by your failures. All you see is your failures. God says, I'm not not talking about that. I'm not dealing with that. I see more inside of you than what happened yesterday. I see more inside of you than what happened last week. I see more inside of you what happened last year. And I'm calling out what I see, not your failures. Failures come. See, Jesus calls out what's in us, not what our past has done to us. He calls out what's in us, not what our past has done to us. And he says, come. He recruits from the pit as well as from the penthouse. Come. He recruits based on what he knows about you, not what they think about you. How many times do we allow people's opinion to keep us inside the boat? I would do it. I would say it. I would. But they're going to think blah, blah, blah. It's not about what they think. It's about what he thinks. And I don't mean it in a disrespectful way. You got to be more obedient to God than man. The Bible says in verse 29, and when Peter had come down out of the boat, The Bible says that he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Gosh. I can see the disciples. Whoa, 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 whoa. Get back here. You're crazy. See, here's the thing. Peter did not step out on nothing. Peter stepped out on Jesus' word, come. Come. In the very moment that Jesus said, come, Jesus made provision for Peter to come. One word from God 
can change your life. One dream, one vision, one idea from God, one simple act of obedience can change your life and impact the world for generations to come. Watch this, church. So Peter didn't step out on nothing. Peter stepped out on everything. God's word is everything. I'm going to teach you next Sunday how God places his word above his name. See, Isaiah chapter 55 verse 11 says this. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. You see this? It shall not return to me void. So the moment that God told Peter to come, the moment that Jesus told Peter to come, he could not fail because he told him to come and his word will not return back to him void. What does it do? Well, it shall accomplish what I please. And it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. How can you fail when his word doesn't fail? Catch this today, church. God doesn't call us out of our comfort zones to see us fail. God calls us out of our comfort zones because he knows that we're failing by staying in them. See, the boat was created for leisure. You was created to conquer. The boat is fulfilling its duties. The boat is fulfilling its calling. But what about you? The boat is for leisure. You was created to conquer. Genesis 126, you was created to rule. You was created to establish things. That's why the final thought today is this. Stay focused. It's a lot of stuff today that's going to try to pull you away from who you are and what you're supposed to do. My God, you better hear what the Lord is saying through his word today. Stay focused. Stay focused. Stay focused. Stay focused. Look at verse 30. The Bible says, but when, but when he saw the wind, when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink. And I believe today, see, the enemy always desires to try to produce what God is producing. So, the Holy Spirit comes in the form of wind. The enemy also tries to come in the form of wind, a whole different wind, though. And now there's another wind that's blowing. And this wind is distracting us. This wind that is blowing is causing us to lose our focus off of God. This wind that is blowing is causing us to look to this side, look to that side, question this and question that. And the Bible says the moment he got caught up in the wind, he began to sink. And you want to know what's going on with our brothers and our sisters? The wind is blowing, but it's not the wind of the Holy Spirit. It's the wind of lies. It's the wind of deception. It's the wind of everything that's not of God. And people are caught up in the wrong wind, and now their faith is sinking. That's what's going on right now. They're caught up in the wind. And what was that? And what was this? The Bible says that we got to make sure that we're not caught up in all these things easily. Blow which in every way. What does the wind look like? In my study time, I said, Holy Spirit. I said, what does the wind look like? He saw the wind. The wind. He said, son, the wind looks like obstacles. It looks like when the odds are stacked up against you. It looks like when the facts try to override God's truth. 
The Bible says that Peter saw the wind. Peter saw the effects of the wind. He saw what the wind was doing around him. And that's why, church, hear me, y'all, through it all, you have to stay focused on the one who called you to it in the first place. Don't get caught up in the wind. I love you. If you get caught up in the wind, you're going to be caught up in the wind. I got to stay focused. I got to stay in the word. I got to stay in his presence. I got to stay in prayer through it all. You have to stay focused on the one who called you to it in the first place place because see the same faith that it took to get out of the boat is the same faith that it's going to take for you to keep walking on the water same faith get out the boat same faith keep walking see getting out of the boat represents salvation almost that's the first step but it takes so much more faith to keep walking See, faith isn't a one-time event. What is it, A.B.? Faith is a lifestyle. Faith is not just a one-time, it's not a Sunday thing. It's not a one-time event. Faith is a lifestyle. That's why at least four times in the Bible, the Bible says, but the just shall live by faith. But the just shall live by faith. It's found in Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4, Romans 1 17, Galatians 3 11, Hebrews 10 38. The just shall live by faith. The best advice I can tell you today is this. In the midst of the storm, you have to keep listening to his voice by faith. Because his voice will help you win over the wind. His voice. His voice. Now, I, I don't, I'm not into opinions. I'm into the word of God. I'm into his voice. His voice will help you win over the wind. As we close, Jesus himself said, when he was brought out, when he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. And his sheep follow him because they know his voice. Verse 5 says, but they will never follow a stranger. They will never follow a stranger. Oh, it's so much lies, so many lies, so much deception. Voices of strangers taking place. Right here, right now, in our lifetime. But they will never follow a stranger. What would they do? In fact, they will run away from him. Because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Voices of strangers tell you that you can't do it. Voices of strangers say you can't be forgiven. All this stuff, that's the voice of a stranger. Verse 27, he says, but my sheep, they hear my voice. And I know them, and they follow me. This motion worship is coming to the stage. I begin to think about this, and I say, why do the sheep follow Jesus? It's because there's no fear in his voice. There's no uncertainty in his voice. There's no condemnation in his voice. There's no ridicule in his voice. Let's go back to verse 5 because you got to see this. They will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. If you cannot find what people are saying to you in the 66 books of the Bible that God gave you, that's a stranger's voice. That's a stranger's voice. I don't care if it's your childhood friend. If it's not found in the word of God, that's a stranger's voice. Not not your friend is a stranger. It's a stranger's voice that's speaking through them. There's some voices in our minds that you and I need to run away from. Make the voice of fear a stranger to you. Make the voice of doubt and unbelief a stranger to you. Make the voice of condemnation a stranger to you. Make the voice of of guilt a stranger to you. Why? His voice will help you win over the wind. Bible says in Matthew chapter 14, verse 31, after Peter says, Lord, save me. What a prayer. What a prayer. Sometimes the best prayer is, Lord, save me. The Bible says in verse 31, and immediately Jesus just 
just stretched out. He just stretched out his hand and caught him. He didn't run to Peter. He didn't swim to Peter. He just stretched out his hand to Peter. Peter was closer than he ever knew, and so are you. He was right where he needed to be. And that's what happens. When you get close to what God is calling you to do, the winds kick up louder than ever before. I came by here to tell somebody, as it relates to becoming, as it relates to doing, you're closer than you think. Stretch out. Don't stress out. Stretch out. Stop stressing out. Stretch out your faith. Stretch out your hope. Stretch out your confession life. Stretch it out. Stop stressing out. The wind is so loud because you're about to win. You come too far to go back now. What's so powerful about it is this. He stretched out. Peter got out the boat. Even when you're outside of your comfort zone, you're never outside of his reach. Even when you're outside of his comfort zone, you're never outside of his reach. Verse 31, again, immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him. Not even tripping. Oh, you a little faith. Why did you doubt? The Bible says in verse 32, and when they had climbed into the boat, the wind died down. I said, Holy Spirit, how did they get back to the boat? He said, how do you think they got back to the boat? Peter walked back to the boat with Jesus. That's what I believe. I believe he didn't even notice he was walking with them. Because when you're walking with them, it's so much better walking with them than it is walking without them. As a matter of fact, it's impossible to do the impossible without God. He didn't even notice it. Probably walked right back to the boat. Didn't even notice it. Because there's something about when I'm walking with God, when I'm walking with Jesus, it makes things so much better. For with God, with God, walking with Jesus back to the boat. Luke 137, for with God, nothing shall be impossible. Twelve disciples, the same boat, the same storm, the same ledge. Only one got out of the boat. What about you today? What's, what's your ledge? What's stopping you from, from getting out the boat? Because I, I see it in your mind. You, you want to step over the ledge, but then you think about your age. You think about your lack of experience. You think about your resume. You think about your past. I got a record. You think about all this stuff, and I believe today that God is asking you, what's stopping you from stopping, from stepping over the ledge? What's your ledge? Is it fear? Is it your age? Is it your lack of experience? Is it what people think about you? It doesn't matter what they think. What is God asking you to do? What is God asking you to become? The ledge. There had to be a sight to see. Can you imagine him taking that first step over the ledge? As you stand to your feet today, what's your ledge? What's stopping you? What's stopping you from taking that first step? 
I would, A.B., but I would get saved, but I would write the book, but I would start the business, but I would start the discipleship group, but I would join. What? What's your ledge? What's stopping you from taking that initial step over the ledge? I'm going to ask our prayer team to get into place. We're going to take a moment to worship through it. If, if you feel that he's calling you in here, Jesus never said, hey, come walk on the water. The Bible says Peter responded. It was something in here. You hear that? Peter responded. Peter replied. Nobody asked the question. It was something in here. If you can't even put in the words, but if it's something in here that's calling you to more, calling you to something new, and you're terrified, it's probably God. So as they begin to worship the same thing he said to Peter, I say to you today, come. I want to know more about Jesus. Come. I'm tired of being stuck in the boat. Good. Come. Heavenly Father, I pray that we would be a church that is full of water walkers and not boat dwellers. I pray, God, that we will stay away from the wind and stay close to your voice as you call us out deep away from our comfort zones. Speak to us in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. The altar is open at this time.